Welcome to today's part of this SPSS methodology, this time with a unit on hierarchical clustering. Basically, in the course of this methodology, we will talk about two types of clustering, hierarchical and partitioning. The difference between the two, aside from the mathematical background, is also in so far that hierarchical clustering can be used in an exploratory context, whereas for partitioning I usually you need to know beforehand how many clusters I'm going to actually construct. So here we can start without any background knowledge and the idea how much should we actually generate, how much clusters should we actually build. For this we have our data set here and well, obviously what we are going to do with clustering is we classify our observations into different groups. So we can find this here under classify. Then we have here two methods, k-means and hierarchical. This is like for partitioning. This is what we are going to use now, hierarchical clustering. We go here. We have to enter here our different variables which should be considered during the clustering process. So here let's select the total spendings, the age of someone, someone's income, and how many people live in his household. So in this case we have four different variables and we want to take a look whether our observations can be grouped into different categories following the information given with those four variables. In this case, what we're going to do is we cluster our cases, so our observations. It's also possible to go here with variables. In this case, we would have, or we want to assign those four different aspects. However, here in this case, and in, well, at least many of the other situations you would go with cluster cases. Okay, but still before we can continue we need to take care of one additional aspect. All of our variables, well except for spendings and income which are both measured in euros, those two have different scales. This is measured in years and this is measured in people. So we need to get rid of the different scales. We can do this and some other aspects with method. Method, we have down here part transform values. We can standardize this, for example, by calculating Z scores. This will take care of us having different scales in our data. Also, what's possible here, we can select different distance or similarity measures. So here, Euclidean distance, squared Euclidean distance, they are typical distance measures, same as Bloch and Minkowski. Pearson's correlation coefficient would be a typical similarity measure. So we stick for our example with the standard with the default solution of squared Euclidean distance. More important, however, is the part up here, the clustering method. Because different clustering methods they have different well, advantages and different disadvantages. The two most important or most interesting ones is the nearest neighbor version and the Ward's method. Nearest neighbor has the advantage it can easily be used to find outliers. Not necessarily should you go with nearest neighbor because nearest neighbor could be like there's one for its himself in a cluster and all the others they consist or they make up the other cluster. So it's not very good if you want to have more or less even sized clusters, but it's good to find outliers. Ward's method, that's actually more or less the opposite of this. Here you would get more or less even sized clusters. So I would personally recommend start with nearest neighbor and afterwards go with what methods after you cleaned up your data set and then find decently sized cluster assignments. So we start as well here with nearest neighbor, 
continue and then click OK. So we get short overview and then our agglomeration schedule. I will get back to this in the next run. First off, we see there's not basically a lot done. That's because we missed an important aspect. Here it would just tell us which two clusters are combined in which step. Okay, this is could be read if someone understands what's actually done here. But we would like some more insights on this. That's why we go back to classify hierarchical clusters and click on plots and select here as well the dendrogram. Click on OK and we see here the first part looks the same but we get a graph like this. This is actually pretty nice because this can be interpreted way easier than the one before. We can see here also that those two observations they are pretty similar. So they are summarized in the first step. Then they are quite dissimilar. Only at step 5 are 6 and 8 added. Then at step 7 observation 1 is added and so far and only in the very last step are 4 and 9 added to the other clusters. However, as I said, this is only one way to go about this. We saw here we selected nearest neighbor. So this tells us that potentially the 10 and the 4 and 9 are really dissimilar from the rest because here we see they are whether early summarized into one group then quite a significant distance need to be covered and here again even more distance has to be covered particularly here it is one as well before this is added to the other cluster set so here in this case it would make sense to take a cr more critical look at 10, 4 and 9. However, in this case we leave our data set as is and return again to classify hierarchical clusters and select instead of the nearest neighbor the wards method. Click on OK. OK. And we see our dendrogram changes. We see here we have one group or potentially two groups. If we go with two groups it would be 5 and 7. A second group would be 6, 8 and 1. Then a slightly more dissimilar group 2, 3 and 10. And finally a very different group 4 and 9. And we see here we have two observations, 3, 3, 2. So they are more or less even sized. But how do we know that we actually need to select four or three different clusters? And that's where we return to our agglomeration schedule. Here we have different coefficients. As we see, they are always increasing. But they are increasing with different step sizes. If we see here the last step, that's 12, here it's 8, here it's 5, here it's 4, that's roughly 2.2, that's roughly 1.7, and so forth. This also means more or less the distance covered in the next step. And what we need to find out at this moment is not only where the absolute largest distance is covered, but where the relatively largest distance is covered. So if we go here from 7 or from, from here that's like 2.2 that's less than 5, uh, 50% increase. If we then go here with more than 4, so that's I would say roughly 60% increase. If we go here from 11 to 16, that's again less than 50%. With 8, that's again around 
this is 12 again around 50 percent so the largest distance relatively speaking covered is from 5 to 6 this means we keep four different clusters it's like four steps left meaning we keep four different clusters so our solution would be cluster 1 cluster 2 cluster 3 and cluster 4 if you cannot see this directly you could also double click here we're not going to do this but just to show you select those coefficients enter them into Excel and draw a graph a line graph and then take a look where the largest band in this line graph is and this would tell you the ideal numbers of clusters to select because at this point the relative distance covered is the greatest thereby we should stop at this step okay so far so good we're not yet finished because this is only like the analytical part if at this point we know we want to have four clusters we can go back to hierarchical and could go here to save and tell him save the solution for four clusters continue ok so he runs the same analytical as before but we see here in the background he generated a new variable new variable which contains the cluster um, memberships so case 1 goes to cluster 1 case 2 and 3 to cluster 2 and so forth this is pretty interesting because then we can use this part here to run further analysis and we can use this here in other methods where we need it like a categorization based on more of those variables so we could use for example this here then as input for a variance analysis test whether those groups actually are significantly different or we can split this up in more dummy variables and include this in a regression analysis get an idea how different, for example, regarding on special, uh, fashion and clothing, the different groups are, as compared, for example, to cluster 1. So we have, for example, here this value. Then we can get an idea. Is there a significantly different behavior for the, all the different categories? Well, this is a pretty neat thing to have. However, well, at this point, we'll stop with this session. I hope up to this point you learned something from this and you enjoyed listening to it. And well, if you want to see more of this type of videos, feel free to visit the rest of this methodology. Until then, see you and goodbye.